So, since we're here tonight, uh, let's open our Bibles to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Colossians, chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 15 through 20 this evening. Colossians 1, 15 through 20, Paul writes, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Through him I say, whether things on the earth or in heaven. In his commentary on Colossians, R. Kent Hughes records an account involving the World Columbian Exposition and D.L. Moody. In the commentary, he uh, Hughes writes, almost a hundred years ago, in 1893, the famous Columbian Exposition was held in Chicago, and an astronomical number of people, especially in the pre-automobile days, some 21 million people, visited the exhibits. America, and in particular Chicago, which had risen phoenix-like from the great fire of 1871, was showing off to the rest of the world, and the show was good. Among the features of the Columbian Exposition was the, world of, was the World Parliament of Religions, in which representatives of the world's religions met to share their best points and perhaps come up with a new world religion. Dio Moody saw this as a great chance for evangelism. Moody commissioned evangelists and set them up in preaching posts throughout the city. He used churches, rented theaters. He even rented a circus tent to preach the word. Moody's friends wanted him to attack the parliament of religions, but he refused, saying, I'm going to make Jesus Christ so attractive that men will turn to him. D.L. Moody knew that the preaching of Christ preeminent as the peerless, supreme, all-sufficient Christ clearly presented would do the job, and indeed it did. The Chicago campaign of 1893 is considered one of his greatest evangelistic works in Moody's celebrated life, and thousands came to know Christ. Now, we understand that salvation is entirely a work of God. It is not a mere matter of presenting him a certain way and people will respond with faith. The point is, Moody had the goal of showing Christ as he is, not as some kind of greeting card Jesus, not as some kind of medieval, somber-looking painting of Jesus, not as the Jesus found on prayer candles, but the Jesus as the Bible presents him as the living God of the universe, the one who is above all, above all creation, including everything that's been created, the universe, the cosmos, angelic beings, people, everything is subject to him. This was Moody's goal, to show people that Jesus, to show them that there was no other place that they could go but to Jesus. Now, this is not a unique uh, goal of Moody. It is a time-honored tradition that goes back to the apostolic age. The view that presents Christ as the first place in all creation. You see, Paul was dealing with, a, with, with an issue in Colossae. False teachers had come there and begun to espouse these Gnostic ideas that Jesus was merely just one of many emanations from the true God. That Jesus, in their teaching, was merely stepping stones to finding this unknown, unknowable God. That he was certainly not, as he said that himself was, the way, the truth, and the life. The apostolic church knew better than these Gnostic heretics, though. They knew who Jesus was by his teaching. By how the gospels, I'm sorry, the scriptures presented him. They understood that all Scripture points to Jesus, not just the New Testament, but the entirety of the Bible. Anyone who says the Old Testament has no bearing in our lives today has never read the Old Testament. All Scripture points to Him. The books of the law 
point to his, the need for him. The prophets, his anticipated coming. The gospels show him made manifest. The apostolic letters, the growth of his church. And Revelation shows us a peek behind the curtain of what is still to come, his ultimate coronation. The Bible in its entirety shows Christ above all things. Paul understood this very well. This is why he penned his book, his letter to the Colossians, to combat this Colossian heresy. Now, the Colossian heresy, as we know it, we, we don't know all elements of it, but it included elements of these Gnostic ideas, but also included elements of Greek philosophy, Jewish legalism, occultism, and asceticism. And in chapter 1 of his letter, Paul is going to combat this heresy. He's going to address the church of Colossae to break down this, this erroneous view of Jesus by presenting him as he truly is. That he is supreme. That there's nothing above him. He wants to show him the immense supremacy of Christ. This is what we want to take a look at this evening. The immense supremacy of Christ. First we see in our text here that Christ is supreme in eternity. Paul writes in verse 15 again, he is the image of the invisible God. Paul begins by making a very clear statement about who Jesus Christ is. He calls him the image of the invisible God. It is no secret, God is invisible. We know that he's omnipresent, he's with us always at, 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 our, at all points in creation, at all times. But we can't be like, oh, he's sitting in row four, uh, section 213. He, he is unseen. And the Bible attests to this fact. 1 Timothy 1.17 says, And now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, to be honor and glory forever. Amen. Hebrews 11.27, By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing who is unseen. John 1.18 also affirms this. No one has seen God at any time. John would go on to say, though, about Jesus, that the only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he explained him. John literally expressing the idea that Jesus is the actual exegesis of God. Paul calls him the image of this invisible God. This is the Greek word icon, from which we derive our English word icon. And this word can express really two ideas. One is an image representation, such like in Matthew 22, verse 20, when Jesus explaining taxes to the disciples says, and he said to them, whose likeness and inscription of this? Hey, Jesus telling them, is this Caesar's face on this coin? Then give it to Caesar. Hey, there's no biblical reason not to pay your taxes. George Washington's face is on the dollar. Give it to George Washington. But there's another more impressive meaning of this word, and it is the, it is the, the meaning that Paul is using here. And it, it carries with the idea of manifestation. Manifestation. That Jesus is not just some mere plaster mold of God, that he is God made manifest. Hebrews 1.3, he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the work of his power. And when he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The author of Hebrews is explaining it this way. He's the exact representation of God. It carries with the idea of seeing God by seeing Jesus. Gnostic believers Explain Jesus as some second-rate stepping stone. But this, could be, this couldn't be further from the truth. Now some say, well, well isn't, aren't all men created in the image of God? Well, yes. 1 Corinthians eleven seven: 7, For man ought not to have his head covered, for he is the image of the glory of God. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God discussing amongst the Trinity... It says, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. 
So all men are created in God's image like this. Like, well, no. MacArthur explains in his commentary, although man is the icon of God, man is not the perfect image of God. Humans are made in God's image in that they have rational personality. Like God, they possess intellect, emotion, and will. Now, that's not free will, by the way, uh, by which they're able to think, feel, and choose. We humans are not, however, made in God's image morally because he is holy and we are sinful. Nor are we created in his image essentially. We humans do not possess his incommunicable attributes like omniscience, omnipotence, immutability, omnipresence. We are human and not divine. These are things that cannot be said of Jesus. That he is not these things. Because he possesses these qualities. He possesses all of God's qualities physically and essentially. He is God, very God. The fall of man, thus the entrance of sin into the created world, changed us forever. Before the fall, we were innocent, immortal, free from sickness and pain, because there was no sin. But when Adam and Eve chose to enter into sin, they chose to rebel against God, they forfeited those qualities in the worst trade deal in human history, sacrificing these qualities of innocence for sin and sickness and suffering and death. They got ripped off. Jesus is not like this. He is the absolute and complete image of God. He did not become like that at his incarnation. He did not, as some have said, taken on the spirit of Christ at his baptism. He has been from the beginning God, very God. We already looked at Hebrews 1.3 this morning, but I want to read just a portion of it again when he says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. He reflects God like the sun would reflect the sun. John 14, 9, he who has seen me has seen the Father, Jesus says. Philippians 2, 6, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. In Jesus, we see the invisible God take on visible flesh. John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Paul here in Colossians 1 is emphasizing the fact that Jesus is the complete and full disclosure of God. Jesus is God in human flesh. He went out of his way to tell people this. John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. Jesus using that personal name of God to explain who he was. John 10, 30, 33, and the fa- I and the Father are one. And the Jews knew what he was saying. If we looked further down in John chapter 10, verse 33, the Jews answered him, For good works we do not stone you, but for your blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus wasn't mincing words with them. He was very clear. I am God. The rest of the Bible attests to this fact. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John uh, John 20, 28, Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Romans 9, 5, whose are the fathers, and whose are in Christ according to the flesh? Who is over all God, blessed forever, amen. Philippians 2, 6, we already read that one, I'll skip that one. Colossians 2, 9, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Hebrews 1, 8, but the Son says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. 2 Timothy, 2 Peter 1, 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who received a faith of the same kind as ours, be the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible is very clear about who Jesus is. 
As a matter of fact, for anyone to, to claim that Jesus is not fully God is someone who has had their mind darkened by Satan himself. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Church history is full of men who tried to deny the deity of Christ. One such man is Arius, the opponent of Athanasius, who championed the idea that there was a time when he was not. And the church responded with swift condemnation on this. Affirming Jesus as the Bible clearly presents him, God. He is supreme in eternity because he is eternal God. There was no time when he was not. He always has been. He always will be. Eternal and holy God. But Jesus is also supreme in creation. Paul writes, he is the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and are for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. We see Paul begin to build this argument that Jesus is completely supreme because he's supreme as, the, as its creator. He says in verse the end of verse 15, that he's the firstborn of all creation. Now this teaching, if one were to give it sort of a, a no attention sort of glance, if you were to read the physical words on the page and then turn your mind off, maybe you could say, uh, I think it said something about him being born first, what? But the moment we engage our minds, this is not what he is saying. Mainly in Mainline cultic groups today like the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons would make the claim that Jesus is not the Son of God in that he is God, but rather he is a created being. But these are really just modern day adaptations of Gnosticism and Arianism. All of these men claimed to look at pastors like this and say that, well, okay, he's clearly a created being. It says firstborn, so he must have been like he had the first appointment in the universe for being born. Well, this is nonsense. This is absolute nonsense. These groups ignore the context of this passage here and other passages, like John 1, 1, for example, which we've already read, which teaches him clearly as the creator. The Greek word translated here as firstborn is prototokos. It's a fantastic word to say. It means firstborn. Now, it could mean, chronologically speaking, like in Luke chapter 2, verse 7, where Luke records, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. Now, Jesus was Mary's first child. She would go on to have more children. It always boggles my mind, this idea of the perpetual virginity of Mary. She, Jesus had half-brothers. But there's a much more important meaning to this word here. And it's the meaning Paul means here. It refers to rank or to position. This is what Paul is referring to. For example, we can see a version of this used in the translation of Exodus 4.22. And it says, and then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn. Well, Israel's a nation. How can Israel as a nation be born all at once? It can't be. So this has to mean something else. You see, firstborn was a title. It carried the weight of a, the highest position. This is what Paul meant here. Jesus is, as William Hendrickson put it, one whom belongs the right and dignity of the firstborn in relation to every creature. He is prior to, distinct from, and highly exalted above every creature. As the firstborn, he is the heir and the ruler of all. Jesus being called the firstborn here is, has nothing to do with chronologic order and everything to do with the importance of who he is and what 
his position as God means. There are lots of reasons to discredit the idea that Jesus is a created being. But one of the silliest ones that I, I don't understand how people don't think of this is to say that Jesus is the firstborn. How, how do you mesh that with John 1.18 who calls him the only begotten? How can you be both the firstborn and the only born? The firstborn implies a second born. There's a logical, logically it doesn't make sense. You must throw a verse like John 1.18 out the window. Further, for, for Paul to be expressing the idea that Jesus is the first created being, he'd actually be agreeing with the people he's writing against. Logically, that argument doesn't make any sense. It's nonsense. The context of this verse, as we will see in a moment, disagrees with this complete erroneous interpretation. See, Christ is creator. Verse 16, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities. Christ is meant to have the highest honor because he is the creator. The Colossian heretic said that Christ was just one of many emanations. By no means was he creator God, but this position the Apostle Paul utterly rejects. And the author of Hebrews agrees with him. So does the Apostle John. John 1, 3, all things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing has come into being that came has come into being. Hebrews 1, 2, in these last days spoken to us in the Son of God, whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he made the world. Jesus is the active agent of creation. This includes all things. All things. Not some things, not most things. Paul says all things. If I say to my kids, clean up all your toys, and I come in and they've cleaned up some of their toys, that's not the same thing. Paul says all things. It makes no difference, material or spiritual, he created them all, and he's in subject to none of them. From created entity, uh, items like Betelgeuse, whose diameter is a 100 million miles to the tiniest insect. Jesus is creator of all things and creation testifies about him. All over creation we see the images of intelligent design that was used to make it. The vastness of creation screams of his glory. Psalm 19, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. The evidence is so overwhelming, it is so clear that denying it is an act of human will by sinful men. Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Paul is going to say, Paul goes on to say that he's above all things, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. And while it is true that Jesus is above all earthly kings and kingdoms, Paul here is addressing a specific portion of the Colossian heresy that refers to angelic beings. These four distinct groups would have referred to four angel groupings. And Paul is explaining the idea that there is no angelic being that is above Christ. He is above all things. As a matter of fact, angels worship him. Hebrews 1, 7 through 8. And the angels, he says, who made his angels' wings and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is, in your, is the scepter of his kingdom. And Ephesians 1, 21. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, every name that is named, not only this age or the age to come. Paul's expressing the idea that Jesus is above all created things. There is nothing that is above him. 1 Peter 3, 22. Who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven, after angels and authorities, powers have been subjected to him. Scripture time and time again makes it clear, nothing is above Jesus. No created power, no, no, no angelic entity. 
Nothing is above him. He is creator and he is ruler of all things. He is the goal of creation. Paul says, all things have been created through him and are for him. Creation wasn't just done by him, it was done for him. Peter O'Brien says, Paul's teaching about Christ as the goal of all creation. It finds no parallel in Jewish wisdom literature or the rest of the extant Jewish material for that matter. Jesus is unique in that he is the, the purpose behind creation. All things began with him and they will end with him. Revelation 22, 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Philippians 2, 11, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All things exist to bring God glory. It is the chief end of man, is it not? And one day, it's exactly what everything will do. When he returns and he sets all things right and he separates the wheats from the tares, every tongue will confess of their own volition or because he will make them that he is Lord. Jesus is the goal of all creation. He's its creator. He's also its sustainer. Verse 17, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Here we see Paul's description of Jesus as the one who sustains all of the creation that he himself has put into place. He cannot be subject to creation. He created it. And if he doesn't hold on to it, it doesn't exist. This is the Greek word synestikin. And it is in the perfect tense. Based on that past event of Christ's creation... The perfect tense indicates a continuous present action. It's having, it's, creation is holding together because Jesus is continuing to sustain it. He created it and he's holding it together. D.L. Chestnut, who penned the book The Atom Speaks, writes this. Consider the dilemma of the nuclear physicist. When he finally looks in utter amazement at the pattern he has just drawn of the oxygen nucleus... For here are eight positively charged protons closely associated together in the confines of this tiny nucleus. With them are eight neutrons, a total of 16 particles, eight positively charged and eight with no charge. Earlier physicists had discovered that like charges of electricity and like magnetic poles repel each other. And, op and opposite charges attract each other. And the entire history of the electrical phenomenon and electrical equipment has been built up on the priceless, on these principles, is what that should say, known as Combs' law of electrostatic force and the law of magnetism. What's wrong, he asks. What holds the nucleus together? Why doesn't it fly apart? And therefore, why don't all atoms fly apart? Chestnut goes on to describe the results of experiments done in the 1920s and 30s where scientists went and smashed atoms together. Something I don't recommend you do in your backyard. And after the result of these experiments, they came up with this idea of strong nuclear force. That's what holds atoms together. Strong nuclear force. Well, what is that? Well, it's strong nuclear force. So you can't explain it. No. But it's strong. A physicist named, named George Gamlow, who has his name attached to the theory of the Big Bang, wrote this. The fact is we live in a world which, every, uh, which practically every object is a potential nuclear explosive. That's comforting. Physicist Carl Dar uh, Darrow, who, who worked for... Bell Enterprises stated that this way, all massive nuclei have no right to be alive at all. Indeed, they should all, should they, they should never have been created. If created, they should have blown apart instantly. Yet here they all are. Some inflexible inhibition is also a secret. Thus, it's reserved by nature for herself. Why do nucleuses hold together? 
because nature wants them to. Okay. Christ holds all creation together. He created it and he's holding it together. He's sustaining it. But he's not going to do this forever. There is going to come a time where he will release his sustaining grace from this world. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burnt up. One day Jesus will let go and the force that is holding this universe together will be gone. Until that point, we should thank God for his grace, for the opportunity we have to wake up and marvel at what he has done and what he is doing. Christ is supreme in eternity. Christ is supreme in creation. Lastly, Christ is supreme in redemption. Verses 18 through 20. And he is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Through him I say, whether things on the earth or things in heaven. Jesus is the head of the church, Paul says. Jesus Christ reigns and sustains all of creation. He also reigns over the church. In earlier letters of Paul, describes the church as a body. Romans 12.5 So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 31. For time's sake, I'm only going to read verse 27. Now you are Christ's body and individual members of it. However, we don't see the expression that Christ is the head before he, Paul writes it in Colossians here. And some people have thought, well, maybe, maybe Paul didn't write this book. That's a silly argument. You see, in Colossians here, Paul is addressing a heresy about Jesus not being preeminent. So, of course, he would express the idea of Jesus being preeminent in the church. Now, the expression here is not just meant to convey the idea that Jesus is, sits as the current CEO of Church Inc., but instead that he is the head in the sense that all living things have a head. He gives the church life, he gives us life. Before him, we were dead. He gives us life. He gives the church life. He gives us direction. Jesus, as the head, is the one who gives the church its reason for being. He is an organic head. Colossians 2.19, And not holding fast to the head, from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from God. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Jesus is our head. He gives us life without him. If he's not the head of, if he's not our head, we have no life. If Jesus isn't God, there's nothing for us. We're dead. Any church, religious institution that replaces Jesus as the head is dead. It has no life. Any institution that places the word of a man or a council or a creed over Jesus does not have life in them. They are a dead organization and should be pushed aside. Jesus is a ruling head as much as he is an organic head, though. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, which he bought 
about in Christ and raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age or the age to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him head over all things to the church which is his body, to the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus serves as both the agent of organic life, but he also serves as its ruling head. He gives the orders, not us. No one who stands in front of a pulpit gets to decide what the church is and is not going to do. Church leadership serves under his headship, not a replacement for it. You see, Jesus is its head He's also the source of the church. He's the reason for its being. And he's the beginning, Paul says. He is the beginning or the origin of the church. This, the expression Paul uses here underscores this completely. He is the very beginning. Ephesians 1, 4, and he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we might be holy and blameless before him in love. Now, we can talk about the truths of predestination and election for weeks and weeks on end. However, that's not the point that I want to get out here. What I want to highlight here is that Jesus is the one who chose the church. He is the one who chose the church. He planned for it in eternity past. The very idea of the church originated with him way back before he created a single thing. He planned for it in the past. His sacrificial work on the cross and his resurrection made it a reality. He is the originator of the church. Not any kind of angelic being or special knowledge. It was Jesus giving him him the title of firstborn. Paul says he's the firstborn. That's our, there's our fun word again, prototokos. Here Paul is telling us that everyone who will ever be raised with Christ, that Jesus possesses the highest rank in it. William Henderson explains he is the pathbreaker who holds the key of death in Hades. He has authority over life and death. It is he who on the one hand utterly defeated death and on the other hand brought light and life and incorruptibility through the gospel. John 14, 19 says, Jesus explained, because I live to, you too will live. If it were not for the death of Jesus and his subsequent raising, we would not be raised either. We, we would be without hope. We would be lost forever. We follow him as our head. Had he not been raised, what hope would there have been for us? This is another shot at the idea of Jesus being first chronologically. See, Paul says he's the first born of, of all who were raised, but he was not the first person chronologically to be raised. It was Jairus' daughter, Lazarus, and those who were raised at his crucifixion. The idea of Jesus being first born refers to his rank. They were raised because he would be raised. Without him, there is no resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of all who have fallen asleep. He is preeminent. Paul would, would tell us that if in fact there is no resurrection of the dead, we were all dead in our sins, so... We as Christians are the most to be pitied. But this is not the case, though. Jesus amazingly did raise from the dead because he is God. 
and holds preeminence. Paul says, so that he himself might come and have first place in everything. When you look at all that Jesus has done, who else could hold the position of preeminence that he holds? What other person, what other angelic being could make the claims that he could make, could stand where he stands? What other person created the world, sustains it, runs it, will judge it, and will rule over it? None but Jesus. And it is because of this that he deserves to be, have first place in all things. He deserves the position of honor. He deserves the title of firstborn. It is Christ who brings reconciliation. Verses 19 and 20. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Through him I say whether things on the earth or in heaven. Paul sums up his argument here. Let's us know first, the Father delights in the Son. It was like this in pre-incarnate times, John 17, 5. Now the Father glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. It was like this during his earthly ministry. Matthew 3, 17. And behold, a voice from the heavens said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And he delights now for the fullness of his deity that dwells in him. Paul says, that he is literally filled with his deity. The Gnostics believed that the fullness of God's deity was spread out among many different emanations. Here Paul refutes that by saying, no, it is all in Christ. Pleroma is the word that Paul uses here. It means completely full. Every bit of it is in Jesus. Every bit of the fullness of God is in Jesus. J.B. Lightfoot in his commentary states, On the one hand, in relation to deity, he is the visible image of invisible God. He is not, the only, he's not only the chief manifestation of his divine nature, he exhausts the Godhead manifest. In him resides the totality of divine powers and attributes. From this totality, Gnostic teachers had a technical term, the plentitude. In contrast to their doctrine, Paul asserts and repeats the assertion that the Pleroma abides absolutely and wholly in Christ as the word of God. The entire light is concentrated in him. All deity dwells in Christ, even even, okay, let, let's, let's, let's use a completely impossible hypothetical situation that God wanted to give someone else the full, a bit of the deity. It, it's, all, it's too late. It already is all in Jesus. Verse 20. And through Christ, and Christ alone, is the one who brought about reconciliation that was so desperately needed by us. Verse 20 could be summed up like this. We chose to sin, and as such we broke the world. We ruined the universe and destroyed the peace that existed between us and God. We allowed ourselves to be dead. That's what we wanted, to be dead and separate from God. But because of the cross of Christ, his blood, his death, and his resurrection, sin's power no longer has any place in us. It has been forever conquered. Paul says, we've been bought back. The expression Paul uses here in, in the Greek expresses the idea of being bought back. We have been made peace through the blood of his cross. He says, a transaction occurred. 
his life for ours. We are not free to do as we will. We were purchased, and the price for that purchase was high. The reality and the realization of the price that is paid for us, how can we do anything but go to God? How can we rejoice in anything but Jesus? How can we praise anything but God? Seeing Christ for who he really is keeps our eyes focused. It keeps us from erroneous beliefs. Jesus is the image of the otherwise invisible God who added flesh to himself at his incarnation. He did not lose anything by being born. He took on flesh, being both fully and completely God and fully and completely man. And being God, he holds the highest place. He's the one who rightfully owns the title of firstborn. And all the privilege that comes with it. He was not created. Rather he is creator. He is the goal. He is the sustainer. We and all of creation were made for him. To bring him glory. It's utterly amazing. We couldn't come up with something like that if we wanted to. It is amazing what Christ did for us. As holy, infinite God to come down and rescue a people that spit in his face. A people who he had every right to punish for our wicked rebellion against him. He loved us enough to condescend himself, to come down to this earth and allow us to pretend like we had any kind of judgment over him and kill him. Well, because he cannot overlook sin, he has to deal with sin. Sin must be punished, and it must be by, by the blood of a sacrifice. Too often we take our salvation flippantly. We, f- we forget the fact that, yes, we are forgiven and we are declared righteous, but it is only because someone else took the eternal punishment that was rightfully ours. That was coming for us. And Jesus said, no, I will pay that punishment. I will take that punishment. And he brought us back to life. There is no room for the parliament of world religions. There is no room for a man-made organization. There is no room for a human being to claim any kind of authority. It only belongs to Jesus. He should be first in our families, marriages, professions, ministries, thinking, time, love, conversations, joy, recreation, eating, athletics, art, music, worship, everything he should be at the center of. He is the only one who is worthy. If you were here tonight and you do not know the Lord, you are lost. You need this Savior to save you. You are here today and you are a believer in Jesus. And do not lose focus on who He is and what He has done. He's not greeting card Jesus. He is creator Jesus. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful to you 
that as undeserved sinners, you would come down and rescue us and ransom us from a punishment we rightfully deserved. I pray, Lord, that the focus of everything that we do, say, think, would be a reflection of how supreme you are in the universe. The place of preeminence you should have in all things, Lord. I pray that we would place you at the center of every thought that we have. I pray we would never lose that focus. Lord, be glorified in us in word and deed and thought forever. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.